Hi, and welcome to Introducing the Bible, the program which aims to unpack the most popular book of all time, dust off the contents, and throw its meaning up on the big or little screen for everyone to see. In past episodes, we've uncovered the creation of the world, God's special call to the nation of Israel to be His people, and their triumphant entry into Canaan, God's promised land. But since their arrival, their history has been one failure after another. Instead of becoming God's special people, the Bible shows the nation of Israel turning their back on their Creator. Even Israel's greatest kings, David and Solomon, who helped build Israel's greatest achievement, the Temple of God, failed to live lives dedicated to God. God keeps all of His promises. The Israelites break all of theirs. Rebellion against God leads to rebellion in the Promised Land. The nation descends into civil war and northern and southern kingdoms are established. The histories of both kingdoms end in disaster. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom is destroyed by the ancient Assyrians. In 587 BC, the southern kingdom is conquered by the Babylonians, and the people are carried off into slavery. The last remnant of the nation of Israel disappears, and it looks like God's promises have disappeared with them. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the willow trees we hung our harps. For there those who carried us off demanded music and singing. And our captors called on us to be merry. Sing us one of the songs of Zion, they said. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither away. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried, tear it down to its foundations. Babylon the destroyer, happy is the man who repays you for all that you did to us. Happy is he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. History looks like it's repeating itself. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says Adam and Eve were given a perfect place to live in, with God, in the Garden of Eden. But they turned their backs on him and were driven out. The Israelites were given a perfect place to live in, with God, in the Promised Land. But they turned their backs on him and now they've also been thrown out. So what's happened to God's promise to bless all the families of the earth through one of their descendants? The destruction of the land was in fact God's punishment. Uh, it was a punishment for disobedience. If we go right back to the original contract, the Bible calls it a covenant. God says you will enjoy the land, you will be able to live in it un un unpestered, nobody's going to invade you, you will be healthy, wealthy and wise, to use a cliche. Uh, but if you disobey, said God, I'm going to remove the land from you. It's not an unfamiliar story. We've seen Israel uh, right through the Bible be disobedient to the promises of God. But it, I guess at this point we see it's, it's the final, the last story or the, or the final movement uh, in God moving in judgment against his people. Uh, it was the significance uh, of what happened is uh, that, uh, that Israel has broken the covenant. They have rebelled against God and they've been judged for that. Not only would the land be destroyed, but the people would be taken out of the land. Now that was devastating because God had said, it's yours forever. But we must remember that that promise was conditional. All right? the, 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 the condition was you may enjoy the land, you may stay in the land, provided you take me seriously. Because I call the shots. I'm in charge, says God. I rescued you. I brought you out of Egypt. I gave you the land. I nurtured you. I protected you. The Bible talks about a curse of the covenant, which is a, another way of saying, if you like, a, viola a, a, a penalty for breach of contract. That's basically what it is. So in the clauses of the contract, you disobey me, says God, I will put those clauses into operation. And what were the clauses? You'd lose the land and you would have to leave it. Even before the northern and southern kingdoms were destroyed, 
many of the faithful followers of God were asking why God was allowing so many terrible things to happen to them. It's a question we might well ask today. In those days, God sent prophets, divinely appointed messengers, to give the people their answers. The prophets are an interesting breed of people. The word in the original Hebrew language means spokesperson, right? Somebody who speaks on behalf of a superior. Now, the word prophet, that's purely and simply what it means. So they're messengers. God speaks to them, tells them, I want you to take the message to so-and-so, and here's what I want you to say. They, they were like messengers. They carried a message uh, from God to his people. Uh, it was a message which, uh, which said lots of different things. It explained to God's people what had happened to them, for instance, in, in terms of the exile and the destruction of Jerusalem. It was sometimes a message uh, which was a very harsh message, saying, uh, unless uh, you stop doing what you're going to do, terrible things will happen to you. Uh, sometimes it was a message which called people back to obey God and said, come back to me and, and do the right thing. They're the public relations officials. They're the guys that come before the press of Israel and they say, here's a message from God, listen up. Basically, that's their job. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there when he was given honor and glory by God the Father. When the voice came to him from the supreme glory saying, this is my own dear son, with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now all of this only confirms for us the message of the prophets, to which you would do well to attend, because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no one can interpret any prophecy of Scripture by himself. For it was not through any human whim that men prophesied of old. Men they were. But carried along by the Holy Spirit, they spoke the words of God. The last 17 books of the Old Testament are devoted to the messages of these prophets. They appeared to the people of God over a period of approximately 600 years, and they all had the same basic message. Yeah, the message of the prophets is fairly consistent, and I guess we could sum it up in two words. It was a message of judgment, and it was a message of hope. It was a message of judgment because uh, Israel uh, had, had, had done the wrong thing by God, and, uh, and they were going to be judged for it. And the prophets warned uh, the people of Israel consistently that if their behavior didn't change, if they didn't turn back to God, judgment would fall. They predicted that judgment. And then when that judgment fell, they reminded the people of Israel that in fact they had been judged for their rebellion. Think of it as a kind of a lawsuit, all right? You, you violate your contract, you breach the contract and, and somebody sues you, your employer or your, your bank or whatever. If you've breached contract, you're in trouble. Basically, that's what Israel did. And so their message to Israel was, think of them as kind of covenant lawyers. God is the judge and he sends his prosecuting attorney, all right? Uh, the DA, as they say in the States, all right? He sends the lawyers out with the brief and says, here's the verdict against Israel. Bring them into court. And basically, that's what they did. They warned Israel. They said, you are in trouble. If you don't mend your ways, you're going to be punished. The Babylonians had dragged the people of Israel over 900 kilometres to their own country. There they were put to work as slaves, building, labouring, serving their cruel masters. But the prophets had told the people to live in hope. Their message was one of judgement, but it was also one of hope beyond that judgement. Because it seemed that when, uh, when Israel was uh, taken out of the land, when the temple was destroyed, that was the end of the story. But the prophets said no. God's promises are still God's promises and they will be fulfilled. And they started to talk about a, a fulfillment far off in the future uh, where God would still raise up his people to live in his place under his rule, that his promises would carry on and they'd be fulfilled in a new land uh, with a new king, uh, with a new covenant even, uh, where all, these, uh, all the things that they talked about in the past would be, uh, would be taken forward, renewed uh, for the people of God in the future. God had made three new promises on the foundations of the old ones they'd helped to tear down. 
They would be fulfilled in ways bigger and better than ever before, and human rebellion wouldn't be allowed to take them off course. Firstly, there would be a new journey, just like the exodus out of Egypt to a new land, and the land the Israelites were going to would be far more than the old promised land. It was going to be a whole new creation. If you read some of the prophets in the Old Testament, it talks about a new heavens and a new earth. It's a phrase which suggests a total renewal, like a cosmic renewal. The whole earth is going to be renovated. The new land is described in the prophets in terms of Eden, uh, in much the same way as the promised land was, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of blessing. Uh, a land, uh, I think one of the, they say uh, the lion will uh, lie down, or the wolf or the lion will lie down with the lamb where there'll be uh, peace, uh, where that, uh, that idea, that perfect state in the Garden of Eden, uh, we remember right from the very beginning of the Bible, will be recreated. It'll be that good. Secondly, God promised to make a new covenant with the exiles, one he'd make them able to keep. And unlike the covenant which God made with their fathers, this would be a relationship which would last forever. I am the Lord. I will take you from every nation and country and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and make you clean from all your idols and everything else that has defiled you. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. I will put my spirit in you and I will see to it that you follow my laws and keep all the commands I have given you. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. The old covenant, like the one God gave to Moses, and which was maintained by David and all the Old Testament prophets, was based upon keeping of an external law. In other words, there was literally the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments God gave to Moses. He also instructed Moses to write down on parchment what the law required. So there was actually a document, a book if you like, that told people the way they ought to live. In the New Covenant, the prophet's words are interesting. God says, I will make a new covenant, and he says, I will write my law on your hearts. In other words, it's a kind of a, an internalising because the new covenant will be a different kind of relationship. Interestingly, one that won't rely on external things, but rather an internal awareness of what God requires. Yeah, God promises a, a new covenant that his people will be able to keep because he will actually enable them to keep it. He talks about it as a covenant which is written on the hearts of his people. We've, we've seen all through the Bible that Israel has got a problem, and it's a, a problem with their heart. They need a heart that uh, turns to God rather than turns away from God. And so the new covenant that God promises promises a, a heart transplant, that he will give them a new heart which desires to obey him, that they will know what he wants, and they will love to do that. And God, by his uh, spirit, uh, working in, in tandem with his new heart will enable his people to be the people they always ought to have been but have never but have always failed to be. Thirdly, God promised to give his people a new king. He would be from the family of Jesse, David's descendant, a perfect king who would bring about a lasting peace for the people of God. The prophets promise a new king will come and, and this takes us back to the promise that God made to David. Uh, where a descendant of David would be a, a, a king on the throne of God's people forever. And the prophets talk about a, a new king who will come. Uh, they, they call him uh, the root of Jesse. Uh, in other words, uh, they're referring back to Jesse, David's father, and the idea that, uh, that David's son would be this king. He will be a king who will reign forever, uh, a king who will reign uh, righteously and, and wisely, and uh, who will be able to do all the things that a king under God's rule ought to be able to do. Now, when you think about kings, you think about power, like wealth, um, military might, political clout, all of those things. But this king is going to be a servant. That's the remarkable difference. He will serve his people. He won't lord it over them. He's not interested in military might nor ego tripping. He's not interested in building a world empire like the Romans or the Babylonians or the Assyrians. What is interested is establishing God's kingdom on earth. 
And that rule is going to be characterized by gentleness, mercy, love and compassion for those who wish to join him. But there's a, there's a downside. If you choose not to identify yourself with this new king, you will be judged and your punishment will, will be terrible. And so basically, there is a very dark side, but it's only dark if you reject the king. So this new king is portrayed as a ruler who will rule with gentleness and love for those that wish to devote themselves to him. One opposes him at one's peril. In 538 BC, the great day of the redemption of Israel arrives. Cyrus the Persian, the leader of the victorious armies, gives the Jews permission to return to their promised land. The biblical books of Ezra and Nehemiah describe the rebuilding of Solomon's great temple of God and the broken down walls of Jerusalem. But for all the signs of hope, the land of the promise the Jews left is not the one they return to. As the prophets promised, the people of Israel look forward to a realisation. Obviously, if God promises it, you want to see it happen. And there came a time when they returned to the promised land from exile under the reign of a king called Cyrus. This was very exciting because I guess they were thinking, is this the fulfilment of God's promises? We're going back to the land. Will this be the new land the prophets spoke about? Uh, we're going back to the, to the temple. We can rebuild the city of Jerusalem. All these things are starting to happen. And so they're, they're obviously very excited, but it quickly becomes apparent that this is not the final fulfilment that uh, the prophets have promised. They go back to a land that's supposed to be flowing with milk and honey and there's food shortages. They go back uh, to a, a land where, where a new covenant uh, is supposed to be operating in their heart, yet as we read the Bible, we still see they're the same old people. That They're still making the same mistakes that the people made before. Uh, the temple uh, and, and the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt with great opposition. It's not a triumphant uh, sort of all, all swept before you uh, movement that the prophets seem to be promising. It's, it's, uh, in fact, it's falling far short of their expectations. Very disappointing uh, return at this point. There was a partial fulfilment, if you like, there was a measure of prosperity. There was a measure of political stability. There was a measure of resettlement. But the full answer to the prophecies wasn't to come till something like 400 years or 500 years later. God responds to the doubts of the people in the way that he, uh, he always responds. He speaks to his people. He speaks to them through the prophets. And he sends them a message of hope. He says, don't give up. He says, don't give up uh, trusting in my promises. The fulfillment of those is yet to come. And while you're waiting for those promises to be fulfilled, don't give up obeying me. Don't give away the whole, uh, the whole shebang. Keep uh, living under my rule. Keep, uh, keep obeying my law. Keep hoping and looking forward to the fulfillment of the promises that I will surely bring. The Lord Almighty says, the day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. On that day they will burn up, and there will be nothing left of them. But for you who obey me, my saving power will rise on you like the sun, and bring healing like the sun's rays. You will be as free and happy as calves let out of a stall. On the day when I act, you will overcome the wicked, and they will be like dust under your feet. Remember the teachings of my servant Moses, the laws and commands I gave him at Mount Sinai for all the people of Israel to obey. But before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will send you the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, I would have to come and destroy your country. About 400 years later, this prophecy is fulfilled with the appearance of the last prophet of the Bible, John the Baptist. The Jesus video, based on the Gospel of Luke, takes up the story. As it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, someone is shouting in the desert, get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him to travel. Every valley must be filled up. Every hill and mountain leveled off. 
winding roads must be made straight and the rough paths made smooth and all mankind will see God's salvation. What shall we do? Yes, tell us, You God, brood of vipers! Whoever has two shirts must give one to the man who has none. Right, that's what we have to do. And whoever has food must share it. Teacher, we are tax collectors. What shall we do? Know that well enough. Don't collect more than is legal. And what about us? What are we to do? Don't take money from anyone by force. And don't accuse anyone falsely. Be content with your pay. Tell us, are you Christ? Yes, are you Christ? Tell us! I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I'm not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain and gather the wheat into his barn. Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Obviously, uh, when Israel returned to the land, the promises of God aren't fulfilled. It seems they might be, but they're soon horribly disappointed. So that pushes us forward into the story of the Bible to see when these promises will, in fact, will be fulfilled. When will this king come who will be on the throne of David forever? When will God's people uh, take hold of this promise of land? When will the new covenant be uh, brought about? And this takes us forward to the work of Jesus. Say I was an ancient Jew, an ancient Israelite, and someone said, where are God's people? Well, I could say to them, they live in Canaan. It's actually located on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. It was there. You could actually visit it. In the New Testament, it's not like that. The promises would seem to be that they are transferred from a geographical place to a person. Relationship is still important, but it's now relationship with God through his son, Jesus. He becomes the, the, the pinnacle, the apex of this new relationship. He comes as, uh, as God's king. He brings out uh, or brings forward the new covenant uh, made through his death on the cross. He gives his people promise uh, of, of uh, living forever with God. And so the partial fulfillment we saw in the return to Israel is fulfilled finally and ultimately in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The end of this episode brings us to the end of the Old Testament. The people of Israel have returned to the promised land, but the promise remains partially unfulfilled. We've come to the end of Real One, and if we walked out on the film at this stage, we'd think there'd been little point to the whole story. What follows is a 400-year intermission, a gap in the Bible history in which the people of God are left to hope for the fulfilment of His promises. Then comes the second reel of this colossal feature. The New Testament takes up the story on the other side of that intermission, showing the fulfilment of those long-awaited promises. That fulfilment's the subject of our next episode, as we continue to introduce the Bible. 